this was how they did it. And what a magnificent feat of engineering it turned out to be. Oh, hello. William Jessup, at your service. Back in my day, I was one of the foremost canal engineers in the country. And this magnificent construction came about because of one of my earlier works, the Cromford Canal. It all started back in 1789. That was a year when the Cromford Canal Company was formed by an Act of Parliament with Richard Arkwright as the committee chairman. With all the mining in the area and new cotton mills springing up along the valley, they needed a better way of transporting goods in and out of the valley. I finally completed all 14 miles of the canal by 1794. And in the first six months, we took the princely total of 1,054 pounds in tolls. Then in the 1830s, there was a prolonged dry spell, which together with a lengthy legal dispute with local lead miners over drainage, led to a water shortage. The solution was to take water from the River Derwent, so a temporary pump was installed. But it was decided that something altogether more permanent was required. That's when the Leeward Pump House was built, and here it is. But what impresses you most is its size. But why on earth do you need such a large machine just to take water from the river in order to maintain the level in the canal? As the cotton industry on the River Derwent was so important, the water that powered the mills was protected by an Act of Parliament. Water could only be taken from the river between the hours of 8pm on Saturday to 8pm on Sunday. This is why the engine is so big. It had to extract a large volume of water in such a short time. So how does it work? By the time Leeward was built, steam engines had been in use for over a hundred years. In the first steam engines, as built by Thomas Newcomen in the early 18th century, Water was heated in a boiler and the steam fed into a separate cylinder beneath a piston at atmospheric pressure. The piston is attached to a beam mounted on a pivot, the other end of which is attached to a pump. As the chamber below the cylinder is filled with steam, it is sprayed with cold water which condenses the steam and causes a drop in pressure. It is this vacuum that pulls the piston down, which in turn pulls the beam and operates the pump. This design was later refined by James Watt. The Leeward pump engine operates on exactly these principles, but what's special about it is the scale of it. The beam, which is connected to the piston at one end and the pump at the other, is 33 feet long and weighs 27 tonnes. It makes you wonder how they got it in here. The piston, which is connected to one end, is 50 inches in diameter and goes into a cylinder that is over 10 feet deep. While at the other end is the pump plunger, which weighs over 15 tonnes. And it is this that pulls the piston to the top of the steam cylinder. And it's this upward movement by the plunger that creates the vacuum which draws the water up from the river, 800 gallons with each upward movement. And what's more, it's still working. All to the efforts of a magnificent group of volunteers. And it is they who will take up the story and tell you how they keep the engine running. This is where the process begins, on taking water out of the river and taking it up to the Comfort Canal. It's a steam engine that's actually doing the work, a beam engine, and of course it needs the steam. And this is where the steam is produced in these two boilers. They are not the original boilers, but they are locomotive type. And uh, I say type because they were built specially as stationary boilers. They are too wide in the firebox to fit in a locomotive frames.
This little engine is what we call the boiler feed pump. And what it's doing, it's replacing the steam that we're taking out of the boilers all the time and replacing it with cold water. It's keeping the water level up in the boilers. The engine is a single acting engine, which means that the power is only applied in one direction. The job of the engine is to lift the pump plunger at the other end of the beam, and that means that the power has to be applied in the downward direction by the engine. This is the beam that connects the engine to the pump. Each end of the beam is equipped with James Watt's parallel motion. The function of this is to convert the arc at the end of the beam to a straight line which is required for the pump and for the engine. This is the pump piston which the engine is lifting. It's over four feet diameter, has a nine feet stroke, weighs 15 tonnes and as it ascends it draws four tonnes of water up with it. As it descends by gravity it pushes the four tonnes of water 30 feet up into the canal. This is the piston rod and attached to the piston rod at the bottom is a, the actual piston itself. As this valve opens, it allows steam from the boiler into the top of the cylinder which is actually forcing this piston down. As it reaches the end of its stroke, that valve will then close, this one will open and release the pressure so that the weight of the plunger at the far end will bring the piston back up to the top. So here it is, the Leewood Pump House in all its glory. I hope you can now appreciate how much time and effort went into the construction of it and how much time and effort goes into keeping it running. The coming of the steam engine eventually brought the end of the canals as a method of commercial transport. The railway reached Matlock in 1853 and from then on the canal went into a slow, gentle decline. Today, it is but a quiet backwater. But it is encouraging to see the beam engine still running after all these years. And I fully expect it to go on running for a long time yet. Well, I guess it's time for me to go now. But one never knows. Maybe I'll see you again in another hundred years.